Tonight <coughs> uh, is a special evening. Uh, it is the yurt site uh, of Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato. Uh, so that's really very special. <coughs> and uh, I certainly want to dedicate this shir to the alias Neshama of uh, Rabbi Moshe Chaim ben Yaakov Chai. Um, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato was a very extraordinary person. He one of the uh, masters of Kabbalah. In fact, in the last 500 years, he's one of the greatest Kabbalists of all time. Even the Vilna Goyen said that if, uh, if the Ramchal, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato, was alive at that time of the Vilna Goyen, he was, but then Ramchal was Nifta, died in 1747, and the Vilna Goyen died much later. But uh, by the time the Vilna Goyen uh, ha had uh, become acquainted with the writings of the Ramchal, the Ramchal was no more there. So even he said that, and, uh, that if the Ramchal was alive, he would walk from Vilna to Padua in Italy. And uh, could you imagine the Vilna Goyen saying that about anybody? I mean, he himself was one of the greatest, he certainly was greater than the Akhrenim. They compare him to a Rishon. Uh, the quality of the, uh, the character or the level of the Ramban. But in any case, that's what he said. So we can begin to imagine who this person was. And he was a master of many different fields. For instance, he was a master of logic. He wrote books on logic and methodology. <laughs> he was a tremendous poet. He wrote plays. Uh, he wrote a book on Digduk. He was a tremendous Kabbalist, Hashkofa. He wrote probably one of the greatest uh, ethical svarim Musa Sefer ever written, which is the Mesilla Sisharam. Uh, he was just an extraordinary person. So tonight is his Uh I owe him a tremendous debt because uh, uh, I've uh, spent many, many years learning the Torah of the Ramchal. So he's obviously one of my major rebbies in that sense. Uh, so I want to dedicate this shir to his memory. Today is Chov Vav Iyar, the Sphira, the counting, is Yisoyed Shab Yisoyed, uh, which is the secret uh, foundation of the foundation, which really in many ways clearly illustrates what the Ramchal contributed to, the foundational ideas of Judaism. In any case, uh, so tonight is really a very special night. Now, <clears throat> uh, I'd like to further understand, especially today, because uh, we know that people are going around uh, with tremendous uh, um, confusion in terms of what is happening. Now, I've already given two shiurim on the present-day events, the current events, especially as concerns the coronavirus. But I want to continue with certain ideas. And in a certain sense, what I'm about to say shows you the unbelievable and inscrutable ways that God will bring the redemption. And I want to illustrate that tonight, which is uh, apparently what's going on. <clears throat> but in order to understand that, uh, I just want to uh, give you certain ideas uh, as uh, preliminary information. You should know all the acts of God that God does can be summed up or organized in three ways or three different types of actions. Uh, and an action is called anhoga. These are the acts of gods, uh, God. And, and this is, um, uh, these, th these three ideas constitute the totality of the acts of God. One, there is a anhoga or an act of God or a behavior of God that is called the anhoga sakium. And what that is, is that um, God sets up or He creates the entire creation. That means all the spiritual domains, the worlds of which there are five. And He creates also the, um, not just that, but also the physical world uh, also. So, and He creates that and all the, uh, the, the creatures that He creates and the angels and so on in order to accomplish a specific task. And the one, obviously, who has to uh, accomplish that task is man, and specifically, in mankind, the Jewish people. 
So Hanhokas Atiyam is the setup of the entire scenario in which man can now be placed to do a specific task and as a result of that to fulfill the purpose of creation. So that's called Anogas Hakim. In other words, the, the acts that God does, right, it, in order to allow the purpose to be fulfilled. The second act of God, or the acts of God, uh, in terms of the area itself, is called Anogas Hamishpat. Because God waits for the man to do an act. And he waits for that. And based on the act of man, whether it be for good or bad, then God uh, responds with a consequence. That's justice. Justice is the concept of cause and effect. If you do A, then B happens. That is the concept of justice. It's cause and effect relationship. There's no such thing that you can do something and there's no consequence. And so therefore, not only is there a consequence, but you are the cause of that consequence or effect. You are responsible for that consequence happening. So what God does, the consequence is God responding to you. And therefore, a person is judged. Mankind is judged for their acts. And God can decide either to punish man or to reward man. Uh, and that's the concept of justice. So the acts of God, which are a response to man's behavior, is called Anogas Samishpot, the, the actions of justice. Then there's a third series of actions. Now, if you think about it, <clears throat> mankind can do whatever he wants because he has free will. So it is possible, if you think about it, for all mankind to sin constantly. If that would be the case, then the judgment would decree that mankind should be destroyed or rather not be privy or worthy of getting the future world. And it's possible because man has free will and therefore everybody can exercise their free will and sin constantly. So what would happen therefore is that the entire journey of man, the progression of man himself through the journey of life would be <clears throat> in many ways uh, w wasteful. It would not only that, but it would also frustrate God in that sense, you know, uh, and that means that God's purpose of creation would have been um, frustrated or would never have come to pass. So therefore what God did is he created a third series of actions. And those series of actions is what's called a backup system. What is a backup system? That if mankind doesn't do what is sufficient to do the task, which is tikkun, which is to rectify creation, then God has a backup system that will guarantee that the creation must reach its intended goal, which is the tikkun process, you see. And even though, which is very interesting, even though mankind has free will, but what the idea is that notwithstanding the fact that he's free will and therefore he could sin, uh, mankind must, in a certain sense, you know, there must be a nation in the future world, no matter what mankind does. Where do we see this? Well, think about it. During the flood, what happened? Everybody sinned. In fact, they sinned so grievously that God decided to destroy the world. So we see that it's not that far-fetched. It's possible for mankind <clears throat> to exercise free will in a negative manner. And that's exactly what happened by the Dor Hamabel, which is the generation of the flood. Mankind did that, and instead of bringing a tikkun, a rectification of the world, which means to fulfill the purpose, mankind, instead, the response to their acts was, of course, destruction. So therefore, what God created, or rather instituted, is a anhogo, a series of actions that, notwithstanding man's free will, must guarantee that there will be a future world with some aspect of mankind in it, as a result of the fact that the world has had a tikkun. That's called anhogo sayichud. 
you see. That's a very important idea. It means that the will of God cannot be frustrated, cannot fail. This is what God has done. Now, even Anagasayichod, even the attribute of the backup system, also ultimately works through justice. But it is something that we do not understand. You know, um, in fact, it's the concept of, as we see in the Gemara, rush of a toivloi, an evil person can have tremendous success, hatzlocha, you see, uh, which is contrary to what we think uh, should be. A wicked person should be punished. And it's also tzaddik viraloi, that a righteous person, a great deal of evil, difficult times and suffering will come to the tzaddik. Uh, so when you look at that, based on justice, which is the second Anoga, Anoga Samishpot, the, the actions of justice, doesn't make sense. But therefore we must conclude uh, that these acts are not in line with the second Anoga, which is Anoga Samishpot, the actions of justice. They are rather conformed to Anoga Sayichod, which is the acts that God does to guarantee that the creation will have a tikkun. What that tells us is that we don't really understand how it works, you see. And that itself is a very important idea, that we do not understand the workings of this last series of actions. Now, the question is, why not? Why is that so mysterious, you see? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> there is a famous story in the Chazal, the rabbis, that when Rabbi Akiva was dying, and he was dying at the hands of Rome, it was in Caesarea, and it was on Yom Kippur, and they were killing him, and not only they were killing him, but the way he died was terrible. They put uh, a, a iron combs, so to speak, and they were ripping his back with those iron combs. <clears throat> and before he died, he said, Shema Yisrael. So the Chazal tell us that at that point in time, this is what they said. Now remember, Rabbi Akiva was one of the greatest of the rabbis of the Jews who ever lived. He is responsible for the transmission of the oral law. I mean, he was an astounding person. He knew an unbelievable amount of Chochmah, of Torah. And not only that, he was responsible for the transmission, as I said, of the Torah Shabbat Peh, the oral law to future generations. I mean, who hasn't heard of Rabbi Akiva? So when the Malachim saw what was happening, they said to God, Zu Torah v'zu Schorah? Is this the Torah? Is this the reward of Torah? I mean, this is happening to Rabbi Akiva, right? This kind of behavior on the part of the Romans is, this, is killing Rabbi Akiva, but in such a horrendous manner so they said, this doesn't make sense. This is the Torah. This is what a person does who is so unbelievably righteous. And this is the reward? This is the way he dies? This is what the Malachim said. Because obviously, they had absolutely no comprehension in terms of what was happening to Rabbi Akiva. So God said to them, he responded, he answered, and he said that you must stop asking me that question. But they didn't listen, so they asked again. So God said, if you ask me again, I will destroy the creation, which means I will restore the entire creation to what's called tohu vavohu, which is unformed and void. In other words, I will restore it to the, uh, to the state that it was at the beginning of Bracious, of creation. That's what he said to the angels. Now, that's very difficult to understand. First of all, the angels were right. This is the reward for somebody who has achieved such unbelievable Torah greatness? That's number one. And number two, what kind of response is that? What God was saying, if you don't stop me asking me, I'm gonna, keep, I'm gonna destroy everything, you know? That's not a response, that's a threat. So why would God say that? You know, was God flexing his muscles, so to speak, and saying, if you don't stop it, I'm gonna kill everybody? Is this what was happening? So that chazal is very difficult to understand. But the truth is, 
that there's a very powerful explanation for all of this. What is that? What the Rebunishim was saying, basically, is the following. What is happening to Rabbi Akiva, that he is dying a death which is extraordinary and so against justice, is happening because I have determined that this must happen to this person in order to guarantee the creation has a tikkun rectification. That's what God said. What does that mean? That means I have determined, it's my will, right? And I know what, exactly how it will lead to that. That this is part of Anog Sayyichud. This is part of those actions that guarantee backup system that the world will exist and will have ultimately a tikkun. You see, that's what God said. Now the question is, okay, so why not tell the Malachim what it means and how does it lead to the guarantee of tikkun? But what God said is, I cannot tell you. Why? Because if I tell you the meaning of this, then everybody will know, all the Malachim, including the Satan, the Satan. He will also know. And guess what? The Satan doesn't want this to happen. He doesn't want the tikkun, as I will explain, to occur. You see? So what he will do is in some way uh, 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 claim as a prosecuting attorney, right? Because the Satan is the prosecuting attorney. He's going to claim and prosecute and accuse uh, it's such a claim where he's trying to stop me from doing this because he doesn't want the backup system to be operative. Therefore, he's going to try to stop it. So if I tell you, then the secret is out. Then he will also know. And if he knows, of course, then he's going to try to stop it with the concept of accusations. You see? Uh, therefore, I cannot tell you so that nobody knows. Only I know why this will lead to the tikkun. Uh, what do we see? That Hanogas HaYichod, or those actions that God does to bring a tikkun to creation, is totally beyond the understanding of mankind. In fact, it's totally beyond the understanding of the Malachim, of the angels. Why? Because we see uh, that it must be hidden. In other words, what God was saying is if that I tell you then Sutton will t say, right, he, he will know exactly what's going on. And he, of course, he will prosecute and attempt to stop it. But if he stops it, then there's no guarantee for creation. And if there's no guarantee for creation that it will have a tikkun, guess what? The world will be restored to toy vavoyu. You see? So God wasn't threatening them. He was telling them, I cannot tell you, because if I tell you, right, then the world cannot be guaranteed that it will have its rectification, its tikkun, and therefore the world will go back to the state of toyu vavoyu, unformed and void. You see? So he wasn't threatening the malachim. He was telling them that the significance of me disclosing this idea is the worst thing that I could possibly do. And therefore, I will not say it. Uh, it's a very important idea that we do not understand how Hanhagas HaYichud works. But whenever you see something which is contrary to justice, you should know that those are the acts that God is doing in order to guarantee that there will be a redemption, there will be a messianic era, and there will be an Oilam Habo with, the, with the, the, the Jewish nation and other peoples that they will be in Oilam Habo. Very important idea. Now the question is, how does that work? Well, we know it's a secret, and I told you why. You see, and this explains what, what, why God answered the Malachim, the angels that way. But how does this work? So there's an interesting problem. What's the problem? God creates a Malach. His name is the Satan, the Satan. He has three jobs, you see. He is a tempter. In that role, he's known as the Yetzirah. His second job is that he's an accuser. He's a prosecuting a, a, a attorney, so to speak. He's the heavenly district attorney. That's his second job. That's called the Makatrig, or Satan. And the third job is called <coughs> Malachamovis, the angel of death, where he executes the judgment. Now, here's the problem. Many times, 
throughout history, the Jewish people will sin. And many times they will sin grievously. So therefore, if the Satan um, sees this, which he, of course he always knows in that sense, then he will accuse the Jews, right? And therefore request that justice be done. Punishment, or whatever it is, you see. Uh, so therefore, in a certain sense, God has a difficulty with that. Because there are many times that he does not want to exercise justice at that point in time. You see, he may want to delay it. But the problem is, is if you're facing an accuser, an attorney, a prosecuting attorney, then he represents justice. Therefore, God must get around that. He has to create a situation where he is able to convince the Sutton not to makatre, not to prosecute. That's a very important concept. Has God done that? Yes. Now, there's only one way to do that. How do you get the Sutton not to prosecute? And the answer is, you have to give him a self-interest in not prosecuting. In other words, he has to have a bias. In other words, you have to be able to bribe, bribe the Sutton. So what he'll do is take the bribe and not prosecute the Jews. But what bribe can he have? Because that's his assignment. So what God did is a very remarkable thing. Uh, what he did is that he said to the Sutton, you see, that from now on, until now you survived or your existence was maintained, right? Because I gave you a divine flow. And that flow creates and sustains all, everything in creation. But from now on, what's going to happen, and this happened after the son, sin of Adam Arishan, you can only survive, right, if you get the Jews to sin, A, B, prosecute them, and C, then you could take the Kedusha, the holiness, that would have come if they had not sinned, then you could take that for yourself, and that will empower you it will sustain you, and more than that, it will empower you. That's called Yeniko, where the Sutton can nourish from the holiness that the Jew would have gotten. Instead, he sinned, so that goes to the Sutton. It's a very important concept. Therefore, the Sutton now survives, basically only if he can get the Jews to sin, and then take from their holiness, which they would have gotten had they not sinned, he could take from that holiness, you see, and he not only survives, but he becomes empowered. He becomes extraordinarily powerful. Therefore, the Sutton now has two reasons why he in many ways upholds justice or he prosecutes. One reason, the old reason, is because that was his assignment as a Malach. The second reason now is because if he can prosecute and the Jew is found guilty, then he could take their Kedusha, their holiness, which is the power that the creation has to survive and sustain itself, he could take it for himself. And therefore, not only can he survive <coughs> and maintain himself, but he can also become tremendously powerful. So instead of the Jew taking the holiness, and they become powerful, the Sutton can now be yoinek. He can nourish from that Kedusha and become exceedingly strong and powerful, you see. And that leads to many, many difficult things. So therefore, what God gave the Sutton is a bias. He now has a self-interest beyond his assignment, you see, which is interesting. And therefore, if God can show the Sutton that he can gain more uh, nourishment from not prosecuting instead of prosecuting guess what he's not going to prosecute he should allow God to do what he wants and he won't accuse or prosecute the Jews that they don't deserve it he's going to let it go why because he figures he can get much more kedusha, he can get much more holiness and therefore become unbelievably empowered because of that you see in other words you could bribe the sudden that's called Shulchad Lesotan. Very important concept. Well, the Sotan can now be bribed. What God gains from this, obviously, is that if he wants to give something to the Jews, that essentially justice would stop, 
because of the accusation of the Sultan what happens now is that uh, they get it and the Sultan will cease to prosecute that's a very important idea now this happened throughout history but I will give you two examples one God approaches the Sultan uh, the Bezdin and says okay it's 1898 and the time has come to give the land of Israel Eretz Israel to the Jewish people now immediately the Sultan says wait a minute you can't do that and he accuses them he brings up the tremendous sins of the Jews at that time that they don't deserve to have the land of Israel that's what the Sultan does and based on justice he's correct but God wants to give them Eretz Israel so what does he say he says you know what I'll do I will allow your guys the guys that you have control of the guys that you have tempted to sin and they sin they will have control of Israel first and because of that right if they have control first then when I give the land of Israel to the Jews they will be able to get the Jewish people to sin because they are in control <clears throat> and guess what if the Jews sin then you get Yoinek, you get their nourishment their Kedusha that's what God says so that's a deal so what God is doing he wants to give them the land of Israel but he tells the Sultan you see that but I'm going to offer you something which I think you'll find much more in your self-interest and that is that you can now be empowered because the ones who will get Israel are the Erev Rav and guess what who, who creates or who founds the state of Israel Herzl Herzl who is basically I'm not sure he was an atheist or an agnostic whatever he was but he was a you know person obviously uh, who committed tremendous sins so he's the guy that founds the state of Israel you see and it all starts with this Erev Rav so therefore the Sultan allows this to happen right even though the Jews really are not worthy of it but his self-interest now clouds his judgment interesting concept now there's another example let's say God says in the 60s or 70s or whatever well the time has come now that I have to bring the beginning of the understanding of the messianic light which is basically the study of Kabbalah you see so the Sultan says wait a minute you can't give them this Hasaga because they are involved in so many sins and justice is right so God says but my timetable now says that they have to begin to see this incredible divine light the Kabbalah itself which is the surface of the messianic light but so God says to the Sultan because he has to appease the Sultan in that sense not that he has to but he wants to because he created the Sultan to represent justice and he can't quiet the guy because God wants justice in the end so he says to him I'll tell you what let your guys I will I, anyways, I'll bring the concept of Kabbalah to the world okay and you can get your guys all the Jews that sin right or let's say the Goyim that sin they will take the Kabbalah and they'll degrade it so the Sultan says to himself wait that's not a bad idea because if they degrade it and, 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 and they make it something which is detestable to the Jewish people then the Jewish people won't really look at this you see and that's exactly what happened all of a sudden in the 60s what happens then Kabbalah gets mixed up in what's called you know the new age stuff crystals and you know whatever the, all that stuff and the, and the angels and so on you know and, uh, they, it gets all mixed up with that you see and, and, and not only that but there are people who now begin to use Kabbalah in, in a commercial venture and you know that you're, you're allowed to everybody can learn Kabbalah all of a sudden the Hollywood stars start to get into Kabbalah and so on so what they do is they degrade this unbelievable messianic light so the Sutton said this is great because ultimately speaking it'll be so degraded that the Jewish people many of them won't even bother to get into the Kabbalah you see <coughs> uh, so that's another classic Kabbalistic uh, or rather a classic Shulchan 
uh, bribery that God does in order to bring down the beginning of the messianic light which is the beginning of the understanding of the spiritual world you see uh, and therefore uh, this is how God in many ways negotiates with the Sultan himself you see uh, now so th we now see therefore that God can now do many things even though it would not be uh, in conformity with justice because of what he now did to the Sultan that he gave him a self-interest in not accusing you see <clears throat> but there's something else that God did because you have to remember God has infinite intellect what God does is you know one of the greatest ways to hide what he's going to do from the, uh, from the Sultan because he doesn't want the Sultan to accuse the Jews I'm going to make the Sultan the vehicle or the instrument to bring the redemption in other words, he will not even know what he's doing. He thinks that he's arguing for something in his interest. But really, what it is, is that he himself becomes the instrument of redemption. He is the hand of the redemption, which is unbelievable. That just shows you the power and the intellect of God. How God can make the sudden, the very vehicle to bring the redemption. You see... And that's what happens. That's a very important idea. In fact, the gematria of the Anhogas Hayichod is 496. And we know what Anhogas Hayichod is. It is the actions that God does to bring the guarantee that the world will have its tikkun and there will be an Oilam Habo with the Jewish nation and other peoples in Oilam Habo. So the gematria, which is the numerical value of the letters of Anhogas Hayichod, is 496. But that is the exact same gematria, 496, as the following phrase, biyad sitro achro, in the hand of the other side. The other side refers to the other side of holiness, which of course is the reign, the kingdom of the Sultan. In other words, the Anhogas Hayichod proceeds progresses biyat sitra akhra, in the hands of the Sultan. So the Sultan himself becomes the vehicle for the redemption itself. And in the end, everybody is going to see that. And the one who's going to have a heart attack is the Sultan. That his actions itself, he thought it was benefiting himself. Instead, what he was really doing was bringing the redemption closer. That's a very important concept that the Sultan himself becomes the very instrument to bring the redemption itself. You know, in a certain sense, you could think about that. Moshe Rabbeinu, where did he grow up? He grows up in the house of Parai. But that's ridiculous. Because Parai killed all the Jews because he was informed that a redeemer had been born. So that's the last thing he wanted, is a redeemer that would free the Jews from slavery. <coughs> so what happens? Parai raises the redeemer in his own house. So not only does he not kill Moshe Rabbeinu as an infant, he actually is responsible for the education and the growth of Moshe Rabbeinu in his own house. That's unbelievable. You see, that's how God works. Where you would think that what is going on is impossible to happen. In fact, it's completely a paradox. That's what Para was doing. He was actually giving life to, raising, and educating Moshe Rabbeinu. Ultimately, to come back and be familiar with the kingdom of Egypt, of course, and then to take the Jews out. Wow. It's, in English, it's called ironic. It's a true irony. And that's the concept of what God does. Because the intellect, the mind of God, is so great that he uses the very opposition to bring the redemption or to do his will itself. Very important concept. In any case, uh, we now understand a certain amount of information to understand what is going on today. And believe it or not, you are looking at Dan Hogas Hayichot. You are looking at the actions of God, you see, which we don't understand, but it's actually bringing the Geula. You know, there are people that have asked me, Two things that they said it's you know this is incredible Klai Yisrael just celebrated the Dafyomi cycle 
That means hundreds of thousands of people have completed Shas, which is unbelievable. It's one of the greatest displays of Torah learning known. Imagine hundreds of thousands of Jews have, uh, have learned Shas and they have celebrated it. You see? So the question is, and that was on January 1st. And we know it met life. And then in February, Dirshu did it. So the question is, excuse me, with, with such a tremendous merit, how is it possible, right, that all of a sudden, Torah was taken away from the Jews, right? Because all of a sudden, every shul is closed. Every base medrash is closed, right? There's no more dafyoyim shurim. And not only that, there's so many teachers and gedolim of Klai Yisrael that have died. So how is this possible? This is contrary to what the Jewish people have accomplished. Think about that. It's an incredible question. And the second question I've been asked is, wait a minute. Uh, we know that from Purim until Pesach, Ado, right, begins the Gula. Purim is Mishanichnes Ado, when Ado enters, right? Mar Simcha. Why? Because this is a redemption time. Because when Haman was killed, that was the beginning of an unbelievable time in Klai Israel. And not only that, we go into Nisan, right? Pesach. This is Mangula, right? It says that just like they were redeemed on Nisan, the month of Nisan, they will in the future also be redeemed on Nisan. So how in the world can the coronavirus start, right, on Ado and Nisan? It's the exact opposite, where not only did the redemption not start, what we find is incredible. We find Torah was unbelievable, diminished in the Jewish people. And it's not only Torah, right? But it's also davening, mitzvahs. There's so many things that have been diminished. How's that possible that it actually happened in the time of redemption? Good question. So what are we looking at? We are looking at something which is absolutely a paradox, right? And think about that. <clears throat> Remember what I said. Whenever you look at a paradox, when you look at the fact that this makes absolutely no sense, what are the actions about? You're looking at the actions that God must take to further the redemption. And we have no idea what that means. In fact, you're looking at something that's almost identical to the death of Rabbi Akiva. Think about that. Nobody knew why. But those are the acts of Anangas Hayyichud, which I explained by the death of Rabbi Akiva. What happened today, in this year, 2020, is nothing more than Anangas Hayyichud. Because it is completely unintelligible based on what we know is the justice and the goodness and the kindness of God. It's a complete contradiction to what God stands for. Therefore, it must be part of the actions of an Agus HaYichud, which is the actions that God takes to guarantee the redemption. And this is another replication that is the same parallels the incident of Rebbe Akiva. Now, okay, the question we have to ask now is, that's interesting. Can we figure it out? Is it possible to see how this works in an Agus HaYichud? That would be incredible. Because we can actually begin to get a feel or an insight in how God works. The unbelievable depth of the intellect of God, how it works. And the answer is, yes. We can see what is happening. And that is what I would like to talk about tonight, which is a very important uh, disclosure, actually. <clears throat> Now, I had mentioned in a previous year, the last year I gave about the coronavirus, which is the coronavirus uh, number two, I had given one, and then I gave a second one, and this, of course, is the third one. I had mentioned in the second one a very important Kabbalistic concept, and that is that when God created the world, the or, the Kedusha, the holiness, the light of God, enters the world through a gate that's vast, but as the Jews sin, okay, that gate begins to shut. It closes. I had mentioned that, right? 
until finally the gate closes. Now the problem I mentioned then is that if the ore of God stops coming because the gate is closed, and it was that aperture, that hole is closed, then all creation ceases immediately. <coughs> However, in order to avoid that, what God does is He opens up a window in the gate. You see? So therefore, obviously, much less light is coming through, much less Kedusha, holiness, divine flow is coming through, but the world still survives. But it's nowhere near what it used to be. So the world then becomes, of course, much different because there's much less divine flow. So when the gates close, the windows open. But the problem also I had mentioned is that as the Jews sin, the windows begin to close. You see, because that's Mida connected Mida. You reject God, you reject the holiness, therefore the, wind, the windows that allow the holiness in begins to close. You see, now that's very bad. Because if the gates close, and now the windows are closing, if the windows shut, then the world is destroyed. And I don't mean the world. I mean the entire creation is gone. So obviously, what happens? So the deal is this, is that the windows are allowed to shut up to a, a nanometer slit on the bottom of the window. And that's all the light that comes through. But since it is coming through, the world survives, you see. And before it's about to shut completely, in which case the world would be completely destroyed, the gate opens up, and that's the redemption, you see. And that's that Hogus HaYichud. It will not allow the, the windows to shut. Instead, it will open up the gate immediately prior to the windows shutting. And that's that Hogus HaYichud, you see. So, therefore, that idea is very, very important, you see. Now, <clears throat> how do we begin to understand all of this? Especially that what, what is happening today is an illustration of the Anahogus Yichud. Well, let's think about something. There are certain things that are going on now which are unbelievably threatening to the Sultan. Think a bit. Think about this. We know that Torah is the greatest antidote to the satanic influence. It says that in the Gemara Kedushim, that the Tavlin, or the cure, if you want to use the expression, the uh, antibiotic, so to speak, of the Sutton is Torah. And there are many reasons for that. Why is that? Because Torah, not only does it, when you learn Torah, does it have a tremendous ability to give you Kedusha from within, you begin to feel different. Yes, because Torah and the soul are one. In fact, God, the Torah, the Jew, the Nisham of the Jew, is one. So what happens is when you learn Torah, there is a spiritual effect on your Nishama which begins to change you. And if you keep learning Torah, you will change. In fact, God even says, that if they want to abandon me, God says, Chazal, that God says, I'll avoid that they should abandon me. Fine. But they should learn my Torah. Why? Because the light in the Torah will restore them to me. Because that's what Torah does. You see. So Torah is an incredible antibiotic to the Sutton because of its unbelievable ability to bring down holiness into the world, into your neshama. But there's another concept of why Torah is such an antidote to the Sultan, his, his machinations. And the answer to that is because Torah is the will of God. It has all the mitzvahs, you see? And the greatest enemy of the Sultan is what? Is knowledge. That's it. Uh, the Sultan can only function as a tempter if you don't know anything. The, 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 the greatest vulnerability you have is if you are an Amoritz. And you don't know anything. <clears throat> so obviously what's going to happen is that Satan is going to take advantage of what's called your amaratsis, your ignorance, and get you to sin. So therefore what you must do as an antidote is you need, you need to learn Torah and realize that you are doing a sin. That's the antidote. Uh, it's not only the kedush of the Torah, it's the knowledge of the Torah. 
you see? And that will prevent you from following the sin that the Satan, the Yetzirah, is tempting you. So that's the second reason why Torah is the greatest antidote. You see, ignorance is the worst thing for a Jew. You see. And therefore, <clears throat> that's why it says, Loi Amor, it's chosid. You see, an Amoritz cannot be a chosid. It can't be. Why? Because he didn't know anything. And if he doesn't know anything, then the Satan in some way can convince you to sin. And by the way, as an important idea, <clears throat> okay, do you know why the world is so caught up in smartphones? I, don't, I have to tell you something you don't realize. You know, <clears throat> like I just said, the greatest threat to you as an individual right is ignorance so therefore the sudden must keep you ignorant now but the sudden knows wait a minute if people have time on their hands what they're going to do is begin thinking about their lives well who am i what am i what have i done where am i going do i really have a purpose what is god who is god you see what's a jew you see but a person can only contemplate this if he's got time I see. So it used to be, for instance, a guy, right? Uh, a guy would uh, sit down and relax for a minute. And what would he do, right? He'd think. And, of course, his thinking would lead him into, well, what am I doing with my life? And hopefully he would arrive at a conclusion that he's not doing anything or very little. So he would say, well, I got to learn Torah. I got to search for God and so on. And therefore, he hopefully would repent. So what did the Sutton do? Brilliant strategy. He needs to make sure that you remain ignorant. How? And the answer is by keeping you busy. But how do you keep you busy? The internet. The smartphone. Do you notice everybody looks at their phone all day long? It comes out, right, that nobody's got time to think about their life. Nobody's got time to reevaluate anything. In Hebrew it's called Cheshben HaNefesh. Why? Because you're on a smartphone all day long. The, the smartphone, it's not only what the smartphone has, which you should not, you have to be very careful about. Because once you have the door open to the internet, God forbid what you can be looking at and what you could be thinking. But it's much worse than that. Much worse. And this is the ploy of the Sutton. Keep them busy. So what the Sutton has done is invented two things. He has furthered from his Kitrugim. One is the internet. Because now, it's unbelievable what the internet can provide you. It can provide you with pictures of everything you shouldn't be looking at. Information, social media, shopping. You see, it's unbelievable what you can do with that. So therefore, what he has done, he says, listen, what's going to happen, therefore, is that you're going to be so involved in these things, the internet and smartphone, you're not going to think about yourself. Ah, you're not going to think about yourself. You're finished. These devices are satanic, and you don't even know that. That's why they are so destructive. In any case, that was an aside. But I just want to tell you, and by the way, okay, that was a bribery to the Sultan. And I'll show you how, right? So God comes over to the Sultan and really to the Bezdin and says, okay, I need to create a device right that will globally connect everybody why because when the mashiach comes now everybody will be able to see the mashiach and he can give a shear to seven billion people and therefore i need even to what to create what's called telecommunications you know wireless so everybody even if they're in the middle of the desert can be connected to to all the internet and so on you see so the sun says wait a minute you can't do this you know, they don't deserve to have that type of connectivity to holiness when the Mashiach comes, the Messianic era, or the Shurim of Torah. So God says, okay, I'll tell you what, you get it first. You see, you can have all the schmutz, you can have all the filthy want, and all the nonsense, and the time wasters on the internet. You see, and also with the smartphone. You see, and, and, and therefore the Sutton says to himself, wow. What a way to get everybody not to think about what their life is all about. So the sentence says, okay. So God succeeds in bringing down a device that can give you global connectivity, right? And the Sutton says, fine. That's the bribery of the Sutton. It's incredible when you think about that. 
You see, it's only because a sultan has a bias, he has a self-interest that you can bribe him. And that's what God does all the time, you see. But meanwhile, this is being used in the, in the hands of the sultan. And the re upshot of all this is that nobody thinks about their lives. Therefore, the antidote to fighting the sultan is you have to do what? You have to uh, learn Torah and then you understand what the purpose of life is, who God is, what the mitzvahs are, you see, and what you should be doing. That's why Torah is a tavlin, is an antidote. So what happens? So the sultan realizes, he says, wait a minute, the most dangerous thing to me is Torah. And guess what? Dafyoimi. The Jews are about to celebrate one of the greatest ensembles of the collection of Jews together in the history of the world. When was the last time that hundreds of thousands of Jews are commemorating, not only together, but the feat of finishing Shas? I can't let that happen. This is ridiculous. That is, because he knows that once that happens, then it will increase the amount of people dedicated to learn every day, which is exactly, by the way, what happened. So, Dafyomi is now one of the greatest threats that the Sutton has ever seen. You see? So, therefore, he says to himself, I must stop this. Now, he got wind of it when? When they first signed up for MetLife. He realized what was about to happen, you see. And therefore he realized he must stop this because this is now going to enormously increase the learning of Torah and the Jewish people. And I got to stop this. That's the first threat to the Sutton. The second threat, you see, to the Sutton is what? Is Trump. Why? Because uh, Trump is doing something what? He is fighting the Rasha Be'esav. Remember what I told you, is that Esav is now battling with himself. And Trump represents the good part of Esav doing tshuva, which I talked about at length in many previous shurim. And he's battling the liberals, the progressives, the democrats, you see, the establishment. These are the evil part of Esav, and we see how evil they are in terms of what they do all the time. Uh, so the sudden says to himself, I can't allow this guy to destroy my guys. My guys are the Rosh of Esav. I can't allow him to stop them and destroy them. So therefore, he's threat number two. Threat number three is where he says to himself, wait a minute, Trump is now going to help Eretz Yisrael get back the rest of Eretz Yisrael. Do you notice that Eretz Yisrael is slow, slowly coming back to all the stuff that they really should get to reunite Eretz Yisrael, right? So the Sultan says, hey, wait a minute, I can't allow the Jewish people now to get the land back because that's part of the messianic process where the Jews will now have all their territories back. I cannot allow this, you see. So therefore, that's another threat, you see. And therefore, the Sutton says to himself, wait a minute. <clears throat> uh, right now, Trump has an unbelievable success rate. I can allow him, I cannot allow him to run for president. Because in the second term, when he doesn't even have to worry about an election, he's going to really side up with the Jews. He's going to now give the Jews everything that they want, right? And not only that, in the second term of Trump, he's going to wipe out the establishment uh, because he's no longer encumbered by an election that he has to win. You see, these are incredible threats to the Sutton. I have to stop this at all costs. Why? Because all of this is indicative of, re of a redemption. Ah, so what does the Sutton do? So the Sutton does, of course, what he always does. He accuses. He's Makatreg. He says, wait a minute. No, 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 you can't do this. They don't deserve any of this. You see, they don't deserve, really, to have that type of dafyoimi. You see, all that terror, because there's so many Jews, unfortunately, that sin, right? Trump certainly does not deserve to be elected the second time, right? And not only that, I don't want him to give Eretz Israel to the Jews. You see, I need to stop this. So the Sultan is Makatre. You see, he prosecutes that. Now the question is, how do you stop this? Guess what? The coronavirus.
That's exactly what the coronavirus does. How? Right after the daf yomi, what happens? Coronavirus. All of a sudden, what happens? One. No Torah. There are no yeshivas, right? There's no shuls. Everything is shut. There are no chavruses. There's not even a daf yomi shia, you see? Which is incredible. Not only that, the sudden now, not only that, but he says, or he, he, he makes it possible, that there are many Jews who die, who are tamid chachomim, they are mechanchim. The Jewish people have lost so many Jewish educators, mechanchim, rebbies, teachers, leaders, because I need to stop the growth of spirituality desperately. You see, guess what? That's exactly what the coronavirus has done. It has put a stop to the growth of Torah among the Jewish people. After it was one of the greatest celebrations of Torah in the history of Jews. That's astounding. That's the first thing that the Dever, the coronavirus has done, the plague. The second thing it's done, it has destroyed in many ways the economy of people all over the world. Unfortunately, that applies to a tremendous amount of Jewish people. So what the Sutton is hoping, that if I take away their panosa, right, what their livelihood, then the Jew is going to say he's going to have a tremendous chalisha. He's going to have a tremendous weakening of his faith. Because he's going to say, I can't make a living. What happened? Where's God? How could God do this to me? Right? I do mitzvahs. You see? So he's hoping, in a certain sense, to destroy the belief in God of thousands and thousands of Jews. Because believe me, Tens of thousands of Jews are affected, just like the entire world. And that's what he's hoping. Because remember, he exists because of the sins of the Jews. So he's got them to remove their belief and, and, and say to themselves, well, forget about it. Where is God? How can he do this to me? The, the next thing that the devil, the plague, the coronavirus does is it destroys all the success of Trump. Ah, uh, think about that. The United States in January, before it hit, was probably one of the greatest periods of time in the history of America in terms of success. I'm not going to go through all the things that Trump did, but it was just unbelievable. And that's with all the opposition of the Democrats, right? So what did the devil do? What does the plague do? It destroys every... <coughs> it destroys every single achievement of Trump. And guess what? He's now got to run for president without any of this backing him. That jeopardizes his whole ability to become the next president. It, I mean, think about it. It's brilliant. The coronavirus is a brilliant uh, ploy to do this, to stop the terror of the Jews and to stop their prayer, you see, to stop Trump. In terms of fighting the 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 Rashi of the evil part of Esau, uh, to destroy the success of Trump, because how could he be elected? He's no more no longer coming coming as a knight in shining armor with all this success. You see, it's terrible for him. So he's now got to run against another person, right? Without any indication that he was even successful. Because guess what? The whole country is going to be struggling to make a living. You see. And he's also hoping, of course, that with all of this, he's going to try to stop, you know, that Israel is now so betaken, uh, so busy with trying to get away from the coronavirus, they're not even going to have time to annex the territories. Because they're so busy trying to fight the coronavirus, you see. Wow, what an incredible strategy. <clears throat> and guess what? He succeeded in doing everything. And that's what the coronavirus does. You see, it allows the Sutton to continue existing. You see, and as a result of that, to make sure that what? That the window will close. That's what he wants. Why? Because he believes, which is interesting, the Sutton is not aware of a gate. He only knows about the window. Because he understands that if the window closes totally, which happens as the Jews sin, then he knows that that's the end of the world. But since he already nourished of so much holiness of the Jew, he will survive. Yes, 
because the kedusha that he has in his possession will enable him to survive when the windows shut you see so he's hoping that all of this will lead ultimately to the destruction of the entire world you see <clears throat> which is a very important idea now how does this help or what is God doing about this and the answer is that the Sultan does not understand that he is destroying himself why because what the Sultan has done by accelerating the process of the coronavirus and therefore accelerating the darkness what he has done is accelerated the darkness bringing the redemption closer where the gates now open you see uh, so therefore the Sutton is the agent of accelerating the redemption itself uh, by hastening the darkness uh, which is what he did you see uh, so in that sense <clears throat> he is hastening or accelerating the entire process of redemption by increasing the darkness quicker you see because like this it could have taken many more years for the darkness to be complete uh, in terms of the sins of the Jewish people but by doing this he has actually accelerated and hastened the whole process of darkness which means that brings us much closer to the gate opening which is the redemption uh, you see now the Sultan is not aware of this or he would never do this you see I don't want to uh, and I don't want to bring the gates open he's not aware that there's our gates are going to open he thinks the world will be terminated because that is concealed from the Sultan the Sultan doesn't know everything especially the way Anagas Ayichud works so it comes out that the plague really the coronavirus is really the Anagas Ayichud the God allowed this to work to accelerate the process with unbelievable speed that's Tan Hogesa Yichud, you see? So not only is the redemption going to happen, it's going to happen much quicker than we could ever have imagined. And who is the responsible agent for this? The Sultan himself. What an unbelievable strategy that God is employing. Where well, the Sultan himself is now the very cause of the enormous acceleration of the redemption itself. And you should know, that's why Chazal, it says in Mizma Shil Yom HaShabbos, Ish Ba'al Yeido Oksil Lo Yevon The Chazal asks, who is the Ksil? Who is the, the fool that does not understand this? So Chazal say, that's the Sutton. Why is he called a fool? Why? Because he's actually doing something, right, that brings about his own demise. That's foolish. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that's called a fool. And that's what Chazari say that the word Ksil in Tehillim refers to the Sutton because he's actually bringing about the demise of himself. You see, very important idea. And now we can understand something. There's an argument in the Gemara. Will the Torah be completely forgotten by the Jewish people? Interesting argument. So there's an argument here. The Chachamim say that the Torah will be completely forgotten. Why? Uh, you see, because we know that the redemption can come one of two ways. Either it can come, and the Gemara Sanhedrin talks about this, either the redemption can come, which is called Kulum Chayovim, where every Jew is sinning, and that's how the redemption comes, or it comes Kulum Zakoim, where everybody is righteous. So if everybody is righteous, then clearly the gate will open but if everybody's sinning then the gate will completely close you see and then then the gate will excuse me the window will close and then the gate will open you see either way the gate has to open but it either means that the window <coughs> will approach the nano the nanometer of closure and that's how it opens or it will the gate will open because of the merit and the righteousness of the jews now, in any case, the question is, if it's Kulum Chayovim, if the, the windows are closing, will it close with no Torah, which means that the Torah itself will be forgotten among the Jewish people? Or no, it won't be forgotten. So the Chachomim say it will be completely forgotten. 
which means that it's kulum chayobim. Everybody is now guilty of sin. So therefore the window is about to shut and now the gate. But Rabbi Shimon says no. Rabbi Shimon say, Chas v'sholem, God forbid, that the Torah will never be forgotten among the Jewish people. That's what Rabbi Shimon says. You see? Now, what is Rabbi Shimon really alluding to? Because Rabbi Shimon is alluding to what is happening today. Because the Torah is not forgotten among the Jewish people. Where's the biggest proof? Taf Yoimi. Taf Yoimi obviously is completely contrary to the Torah being forgotten at the end of time. You see? Uh, but we know now, what did the fact of Daf Yomi do? What it did, it became an incredible threat to the Sultan, which meant that the Sultan now has to stop all that Torah, right? And as a result of that, he has accelerated the process. So what Rabbi Shimon is saying, the Torah is not going to be forgotten because we need the Torah not to be forgotten in order that the Sultan should actually be threatened and actually accelerate the process of redemption. You see? So Rabbi Shimon was right that the Torah is not forgotten. But the incredible thing is that the, the, the purpose of the Torah not being forgotten is not because the, only that it would be a terrible thing to Jews to forget their Torah. It just would be unbelievable. But once it's not forgotten, and on the contrary, not only is it not forgotten, but there's an unbelievable event that indicates the incredible revival of Torah. That is the way the, the Sultan got threatened and therefore prosecuted, brought a coronavirus plague, and is accelerating the opening of the gate, you see, and bringing what? And bringing the darkness, because now nobody's learning anything, as I pointed out. So, Rabbi Shimon, it's amazing what Rabbi Shimon said, that it's not just that Torah won't be forgotten, because how could it be forgotten among the Jews? But the fact that it's not forgotten is the very device that God uses to accelerate the process because what it did is incredibly uh, arouse the Sutton to Makatrig, bring a coronavirus to destroy the remnants of Torah, or at least the tribe. And that itself now accelerates the fact that there is no Torah, basically, to a great extent. That accelerates the darkness, and as, uh, and, and as a result of that, the windows are much closer to being shut, and of course the gates will open. You see? It's amazing when you think about it, that the Sultan is the biggest fool because he has now created a scenario which ultimately has enormously accelerated the messianic process by bringing greater darkness and therefore the window is almost shut. And as a result of that, the gates will open, which the Sultan is not aware of. Interesting. We have now observed a very unusual aspect of the Anagas HaYichud. It's amazing when you think about that. We're thinking this is terrible, which of course it is, you see. But really, it's God's way of making a fool out of the Sutton, Biyad Sitra Akhra, which is very, very interesting, you see. And now we understand uh, what I asked before. How is it possible between Purim and Pesach something which is the opposite of redemption? And the answer is no. It accelerates the redemption. And that's why the coronavirus appeared at that time. You see? And how is it possible that this should be happening after a Dafyomi convention? And the answer is, on the contrary, this is made to accelerate the messianic process. And on the contrary, <clears throat> maybe it was in the merit of Dafyomi that this is now happening in that sense. You see? So on the contrary, this coronavirus is, tw is, in, is mamish entwined with the entire messianic process. That is its real nature, you see. And now we understand Rabbi Chiyah Abba, when Rabbi Chiyah Abba says that Somech Limoysa Mashiach, next to the messianic era, right next to it, Deva Godel, there will be a tremendous plague. And Deva Godel obviously means a pandemic, a great uh, a great uh, plague, which is of course a pandemic. Because what he's saying is that you need that pandemic in order for the Sutton to be threatened and to prosecute and to accelerate the entire messianic process, which means to make it darker, you see, and bring the window almost shut. And as a result of that, the window, the gate will now open. 
Therefore, what is the message of all this? That we are much closer to the Mashiach than we can possibly imagine. You see, because of the deva, because of the plague, because of the pandemic of the coronavirus, and because of the incredible darkness, and now we understand why there is darkness, why so many people are dying, educators and leaders, and tzaddikim and rabbonim and mechanchim, teachers and so on, you see? And, wh and why there's so much darkness where there's no yeshivas, there's no dafyomi, there's no shuls and so on, we can now understand that this must happen to accelerate the process. And that's really what Rabbi Chiba Abba is speaking about, you see? So, not only is it not what we think it is, but it's actually part and parcel of the Anhogas HaYichod. Therefore, it's not a contradiction at all to the redemption process, except we didn't understand it. Just like the Malachim didn't understand why Rabbi Akiva had to die also. In any case, so the bad news, as they say, is that this is going on and so on. The good news is that the more it goes on, the greater is the acceleration of the window closing, which brings us much closer to the gate open, and which is the Pekida itself, where the Mashiach will enter and change all of this, you see. In any case, so let's hope that the, uh, the, uh, this will end shortly because its purpose will have been achieved and the uh, gates will open and that all of us certainly uh, by uh, next year will be basking in the light of the Mashiach himself. Thank you.